Now with today's lesson is Dr. Lester Sumrall. Thank you. May I bless you, please. Father, bless these. May they learn. May they know. May they serve it up to others. Make it a blessing, we pray. For your anointing and your goodness and mercies and blessings to these, we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. God spoke to my heart and said that um, every major evil in our times was a blow at immortality. And uh, I'd, I'd never dreamed, you know, of it and had never read anything like that. And so I began to search and, and it began to come like a roaring water, you know, toward me. As I would uh, write down a major sin in America, uh, instantly God would say, it's a blow against immortality. And, and, and beginning in our lesson tonight, and for all these four lessons that we will take uh, during this session, uh, you will see that all of them uh, are a blow at what God created man for. God created man specifically to live forever. And, uh, and God has determined that he, he shall live forever. Uh, and if, if not upon this earth, then he shall live forever in eternity. How many believe that? Yes. Yeah, if, if, you, if you don't, you're in the wrong class. Uh, <laughs> but we're glad you're, glad you're right here. Uh, one gentleman today in our class says, I'm glad to see that you smile uh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, he said, I, I like your questions and answers most, so that's when you smile more. Well, if it takes questions and answers to get me to smile, maybe we'll start with them. <laughs> oh, no, that's in another class. Excuse me. Uh, we, we, are, we are dealing with uh, what is uh, called Lesson 8 in your teaching syllabus. It likely will not be that in the number of lessons that we've already taken, but that's how far along we are. Uh, with, with our teaching, we have covered uh, some tremendous material relative to what is immortality, that man was created for immortality. There's a battle against immortality, and uh, the marching immortals, which happens to be us, and this lesson has to do with the physical death and immortality. Man's most frightening mystery is what happens to him at that point in recorded time, when he ceases to live on the face of this earth, where does he live further? When the curtain is drawn called death, where does he live at that point in time? And then we come to the uh, physical things as if this is an inexplicable question, uh, can it be explained? Can the human personality possibly survive death? Is man immortal? Possibly it is the number one question that can ever enter into the human mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24, it says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, it shall come to pass at that point, saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And so there will come a point in time when there is no more death. Uh, there will be no more a separator uh, from the soul, from the body. And, and, uh, and at that point, at that point, death will be swallowed up in victory, the victory of immortality. And that's what these lessons are all about. Possibly we could call death the great equalizer because kings die, queens die, and po poverty-ridden people die. And it's the great equalizer. Uh, whatever station in life you may have, when it comes to the point of death, it's democratic. All men are equal at that point. So physical death is that great equalizer. It is the phenomenon of the greatest interest on planet Earth. There is no interest to, uh, in any way, come, come to that point of interest. It's the total appointment. Uh, every person that has ever lived will have to come to it unless the Lord comes and receives us unto himself in this generation. In Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so it is a total 
appointment. No one escapes it. No one can get around it. It is a total appointment for the total human race. In a generation of uncertainty that you and I live in today, you can certainly count on death. And so if you say everything's uncertain, you've missed one thing. Well, there are two things. They say that our taxes are certain. <laughs> and they say that death is certain. So we do have two certainties that we must deal with. Death has become, possibly you've read of this, death has become one of the most popular subjects in studies in the universities and colleges of our, of our country and our land. Students are intensely interested. They have group seminars on the subject of death. In one school, I was reading where the students lie in a casket or a coffin, seeking to try to, in some manner, understand, comprehend, or to have some kind of relationship with what we call uh, death. Today, scientists take a, a tremendous interest in death and, and using it for experiment. Some are doing research studies on far frontiers of human existence. Uh, for example, they're even freezing the dead to see in some future time if they cannot further experiment on the person that died at this point, freezing the total, the total body and hoping one day to, uh, to bring it out of refrigeration and see if they can revive it and so forth. Uh, I said here, people are dying to know where, when they're going to die. <laughs> well, maybe that's a small exaggeration. Yeah. Uh, they, they know they're going to die. All men know that. And it's not so important you're dying as where you go after you're dead. Amen. That is the most important thing. Uh, I am sure that it is the most dramatic mystery that man has today. And it should be given a lot of attention. And, and that's the reason why we are delighted to study it. We have the Iron Curtain, the Bamboo Curtain. And with all these mysteries behind those things, death is still our greatest curtain. Uh, it hides the life, of, the, the life after death. It just has a wall there. People have sought to get through that formidable wall, and they just have not been able to do it. And so, in death, it divides time from eternity, and we understand that it, dis it divides space uh, from the beyond. It, it divides the finite from the infinite. And man is just not equipped mentally or spiritually, to adequately apprehend eternity or experience after death. Uh, who wants to be the late Mr. So-and-so? We normally say Mr. Jones, providing there's nobody by that name present. Uh, but we, 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 we want to be the person that's alive today uh, using all the facilities and faculties that God has given us. Now, in your point number six on page 42, death is an enemy. I think most of us would recognize that without any explanation to it. Death is the greatest enemy uh, that man has. In the Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible, in chapter 21 and verse 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's the new Jerusalem that's going to come down, and we're going to dwell with God forever. And at that point, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. And there shall be no more death. How many still believe the Bible? Amen. And there shall be no more death. And isn't that, isn't that simply, isn't that simply amazing? In 1 Corinthians 15 and 26, it says, And the last enemy that she be, shall be destroyed is death. And so he adds up to be the last of our enemies. That we, that our ultimate enemy is death. Uh, that robs us of so much. <laughs> most, most people die before their, before their even before their, uh, their time that belongs to them. And uh, some go a little over the time that's been allotted to them. Uh, just when you are going great, death can stop you dead in your tracks. And, and, and so it is the last enemy. And it, it will be destroyed. And I, Everybody glad for that? Say amen. amen. It is the ultimate enemy of mankind. Death is not a friend to man, or nor to anybody else or anything else. Death is not a friend. Death is a curse. God said, in, in, in the day that you rebel against me, you will die. That was death. 
in Genesis 2, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Death. So death, death came as a curse against uh, rebellion. When, when man rebelled against God, uh, the, the, the fruit of rebellion was the curse of death. Uh, all human persons experience life after death, or whether good or evil, I mean. Uh, they'll even experience eternity without God or with God. They'll either experience eternity in heaven or hell. Uh, we are all immortal, every human being. So, but with us, it's not the, the, the quantity of living, it's the quality. Uh, living with God in heaven is a lot better than living in the hell with the devil. He, he is so disagreeable, nobody wants to live with him. How many believe that? Amen. Well, don't go there then. Be sure to, and don't do that. God only, God only has contact with a total of all dead. Uh, now, now, witchcraft does not, they're, they're liars. They're, they do not. God only has, ha, has contact with the total of all dead. The, the Bible answers every inquiry concerning the dead. If you have an inquiry about it, uh, your answer is in the book of God. And, and you can get an adequate answer. Pagans have a special relationship with cemeteries. Now, I'd like to teach you for a half an hour on that, of course. Uh, they, they believe in vampires. Zombies, ghosts, ghouls, and they have a very strong relationship with cemeteries. Uh, we, we don't. We don't. We have a special relationship with the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> That's our keen relationship. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, uh, we read the story of the first martyr. And, and this is in the relationship of the resurrection and immortality. Stephen knew death only as a separation of his body into his eternal habitation. That, and, and so that's the, the, the quality of death. In Acts 7, 53, who, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, gnashed upon him with their teeth. That was the religious people in Jerusalem, and that was Stephen. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. I'd, I'd like for you to pause there. I always get excited when I, <laughs> when he saw the glory of God. The, the glory of God is visible. The glory of God is visible. I'm looking forward to seeing the glory of God. <laughs> Whew. I, I've seen the crown jewels of, uh, of uh, England and they do sparkle. And I have seen the, the crown jewels of China and, and they, they are rare and beautiful. But when we behold the glory of God, what a day, what a day. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried. That was that religious bunch that didn't, didn't have love in their hearts. Then they cried with a loud voice and stopped up their ears and ran upon Stephen with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at, the, at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God and saying, Now, Lord Jesus... Receive my spirit. When you move from, from the dimension of earth to the dimension of heaven, you see, at, at the point of death, then that is a glorious experience. It is, a, it is a glorious experience. Listen to some of the things the Bible says regarding this subject. And, and John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That was just what Stephen experienced. They, they stoned him with stones until his physical life was crushed. But his spiritual life came tremendously alive in that he saw the glories of heaven and that Jesus had gotten up off his throne and was looking at him. That'll get you excited. Uh, Jesus also said in, in Luke 23 and 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So, so the death on the cross for the thief and also for Jesus was not a terminal point. It was not an end of anything. It, it was not oblivion. Uh, it, was, it was really the wall that, that, that separates eternity uh, from time. And when he passed through that dimension wall, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he had passed from this world of, of feeling and touch into that world of the supernatural and of the eternal world where God is. It's a good passing. 
The Lord Jesus further said in John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That is a, that is a time after the releasing from this body of our eternal spirits and our eternal souls. Also, Jesus said in John 12 and 26, if, if, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. And so Jesus was showing you that life has no turmoil upon the face of this earth, that we are immortals and that we do live forever. And even though we come to the point where, where the natural a uh, human person ceases to be, then the eternal Christian uh, uh, person lives on and on. And he says they live with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 8, we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now that gives you a knowledge of the other side that's tremendous in that he said, I am confident. And he says, we are willing Rather, rather to be uh, absent from the body, because we know to be absent from the body is not annihilation. It is, it's not termination. It is to be present with the Lord. <laughs> Glory be to God. And, uh, and, and that's the hope of every one of us, that we live forever. You know, that's what we mean by being, being immortal. And so in, in the battle for immortality, death is only a stepping stone into the real life and the great life and the abundant life where we're going to live forever. Amen. Now, in, in number 10 here, the unholy will, will also experience immortality of a different nature. In Luke 12 and 20, the Lord Jesus said, God said unto him, uh, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Uh, then those things, those things shall be where shall those things be that thou hast provided? And here was a man that put his total existence into temporal things. And then, then, then God said, this night your soul will be required of you. And then he said, all these things that you have here, what good will they be to you at that point? In the Revelation 20 and 12, it says, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the book, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged. Now, I, I, I want you to, to know something here. I don't know how much of, uh, of, uh, that you've studied relative to prophecy in the end of the world and so forth. But notice here uh, that every person who had ever died came back beginning with Cain, coming right straight back uh, unto a point, and it says, and they were, they were judged, every man according to his works. Now, now, now you see, uh, if you went down to the, to the city jail here and began to talk to those people, uh, maybe half of them or three quarters of them would say, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be here. I I'm innocent. I, I shouldn't be here. Now, did you know that two-thirds of the people in hell right now don't think they should be there? They're mad about it. They said, I'm not getting a square deal. And, and so they're going to come up out of there and they're going to stand before God and they're going to be judged every man according to his works. And you know what, what they're going to do? They're going to say, yeah, I'm guilty. Yeah, I should be there. Every sinner that has ever lived will be convinced that the judgment of God is correct and right and just. Are you here? Yes. Yeah, there won't be anybody in the lake of fire Say, I, I shouldn't be here. Everybody that's there will say, I ought to be here because he will have his true judgment. His time in court will come and, and he will be judged. In verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, death at this point does not mean annihilation. Uh, I don't know that it ever does. It means division. Death means separation. That's all. The word death is, is moving something to something else. Uh, and, but in this case here, uh, the second death, it means that they are forever separated from God, forever separated from happiness, forever separated from peace. In 2 Peter 2 and 9, the Lord knoweth how to, to deliver the godly out of temptation. 
and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. Now that is a tremendous factor and a tremendous truth there. God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. How many believe that? Amen. I don't think you got it. <laughs> there is no temptation ever come to a human that God can't deliver you from. And I want to tell you something. Most people that fall into trouble, look for it and walk into it volitionally. And most people are playing with it on the edges and soon find out they don't have the capacity to quit. You see? Yeah. And, and, and so I visited a doctor in, in, in prison, a medical doctor, and uh, he was in prison for selling drugs to, to high school kids. And, uh, and, and uh, I said, sir, uh, I think you were put in here for two things. One is that you <laughs> worked on people when you were drunk and another that you sold drugs to kids. I says, uh, when did you become an alcoholic? He named the, co the college, supposedly a Christian college. He said, when I went out to a party in college, says the first teaspoon full of alcohol I ever touched, I was an alcoholic. Did you hear me? He told me, he says, I was, he says, I went crazy over it. He said, the first night they had to carry me home. They had to put me to bed. And forever after that, that's what I wanted. I wanted to get souse drunk and somebody else to put me to bed. You don't play with the devil and you don't play with sin or you got it. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. I believe it. You don't have to sin. You don't need to be blaming God or anybody else. You're walking into it of your own will. Stay out of the way. I tell many young ministers, I said, listen to me. The Bible says flee the appearance of evil, not evil. If it looks bad, get out of the way. Run from it. If you run from everything that looks bad, you won't ever be in anything bad. Didn't go over too hot, did it? <laughs> the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. He also knows how to reserve the unjust, the wicked, the sinners, under the day of judgment to be punished. I'm only trying to show you here that immortality does not just belong to the believer. It also belongs to the unbeliever. It doesn't only belong to the Christian. It belongs to the non-Christian. And then it's not the, the quantity of eternal life. Then it's the quality of eternal life. Where you're going to live it in happiness or where you're going to live it in anger and hatred and remorse. And so you, you're the one. You say, well, I was just born to go the wrong way. That's a lie from hell. You sure were not. The Bible says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to everlasting life. The will of God for you is to be happy, to be successful, to go to heaven, and to live with him forever. That is God's will concerning you. And there is no other will for God. God is never happy when you're hurt. He's never happy when you're sad. He is never happy when you're lost. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have. Hey, that's immortality for you. To live with God forever and ever. Salvation is a resurrection to immortality. That's what it's all about. Ephesians 2 and 1, and you hath he quickened. That means made alive. Who were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Same thing that the devil has working in his bunch used to work in us. It did in me. But God took it out. Can you say amen? amen. And hath raised us, us say us, has raised us up together. <laughs> Say together. Yes. Let's keep it that way. The devil liked for us to raise us up separately. Put us all in a little cell by ourselves. Now, I've been living a long time, and ever since I have been in the ministry, I've seen the devil wanting to separate God's people into small groups. And I don't know where Christians ever got it in their head they're supposed to be with a small group. 
And then they get angry at me because I say a little church is a little place where people, where little people with little heads and little hearts get together to talk about little things themselves. <laughs> you say, my church is little. If Jesus is there, it only be little one time, and that's the time you meet the first time. Because they'd go out and tell everybody about it, and the next time you met, Jesus would be there, and a lot of visitors would be there. Glory be to God forever. That's popular, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> He's raised us up together. He's made us to sit together. Say together. together. In heavenly places where we are right here. In Christ Jesus. Now, now, that salvation brings us into a resurrection relating to immortality. Ephesians 4.21 says, If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, the truth is in Jesus that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewed. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Salvation is that, is that resurrection into the immortality that has to do with a good life forever and ever and ever. So salvation plays the part in your eternity to showing where you're going to be on the dark side or the light side, the bright side or the dark side. We're going to be on Jesus' side. 